uh, we should start and um, it's uh, five minutes past the hour. So my name is uh, Egina Francis Makwabe. I'm the consultant physician and nephrologist working with AHN uh, as a, a country medical director. And I'm practicing here in Tanzania. So um, I would I'd like to welcome everyone into today's uh, series number 24, AHN Nephrology webinar. And uh, before we proceed, uh, I'd like to just read uh, a short bio of Dr. Alpana Iyenga. Uh, he's a professor, Department of Pediatric Nephrology, St. John's National Academy of Health Sciences, Bangalore, India. And she has held uh, different position and different recognitions. She's uh, uh, deputy chair, International uh, Society of Nephrology, Clinical Research Program 2019. She has been also in core committee member, ISCN Education in 2019. Uh, she is an executive committee member, ISCN South Asia Region Board uh, from 2019 to 2023. She's the fellow of Royal College of Physicians, uh, London in October 2019. She's also in a core committee member, ISCN WHO Initiative for End Stage Renal Disease. And uh, she's a nephrology specialist member, AB, uh, ABPM, Jan Arohia, Johanna National Health Authority uh, Adim, uh, Administration. So uh, Dr. Pana will take us through a very important uh, glomerular disease in children that is acute uh, glomerular nephritis in children, and it will be a, a case study, a case discussion. So Dr. Alpana, uh, you are welcome, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Makwabe. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, good evening and greetings from Bangalore to all the senior nephrologists, pediatric nephrologists, pediatricians, and pediatric trainees. Um, I, I, I understand that we have a mixed group today, so I'm going to keep this session informal and very basic so that I can relate to each one of you. So please don't hesitate if you have even the silliest question to ask. I first of all must place my thanks to Dr. Lloyd, sir. He's been one of the first nephrologists who inspired me. I was a very junior trainee nearly 20 years back when I worked with Dr. Lloyd and I learned so many um, aspects of nephrology from him and he has no idea about it, but I know how much I learned from him, observing him. And it's really nice that you are all fortunate to have Dr. Lloyd sir amongst you. Uh, I thank all the chairpersons from senior faculty from Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda and um, all the other senior members of your society, the African Health Nephrology Education Program. I would now like to share my slides. So can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can see. Okay. So I know you must be, you must be thinking that the title is missing. I thought that the two pictures here are worth um, the word acute glomerulonephritis. So today we are going to deal with, as you already mentioned, a very, very common glomerular disease seen in children, especially from this part of the world, from the tropical region. And we have that in common. Africa and India do um, have uh, an experience with uh, caring for children with acute infection-related glomerulonephritis or post-streptococcal-related glomerulonephritis. Before I dive into this topic, let me tell you that I'm really, I, I was really excited when Dr. Lloyd asked me to join this webinar series because I have a very close connect with Africa. And uh, this was one opportunity for me to rewind and recall my lovely days that I spent in Africa. 
uh, though it was uh, quite a few years ago, there are vivid memories of my visit and my time with people in Kenya nearly a decade back. And I brought this carefully from Kenya, the big five. I had a wonderful time at the Masai Mara. And I still remember that song, Jambo Guana. Uh, it means hello. So uh, these are lovely memories of my visit in, to Kenya. And then fortunately we had a professional rapport with a doctor from Ethiopia, Dr. Beza. And she came all over uh, to St. John's Hospital, joined our team. Uh, she was with us for more than a year, got trained in nephrology. She's from Addis Ababa Hospital. And then she went back and she actually started pediatric nephrology services in a small way, almost single-handed, but uh, is still doing very well. So uh, she then organized a CME in Ethiopia. And we were all there uh, for the CME in 2017. And that's when I realized that again, we have something in common. Uh, the participants for that CME were not just pediatricians. They were general practitioners. They were uh, physicians who would look after adults, who would look, look after children. And this is quite a common scene even in India. So that was one of our very memorable visits uh, to Ethiopia. So, Having said that, I'm happy to be here to discuss, though it's online, but it's nice to connect with you all again. I'm here to discuss how to recognize and confirm presence of hematuria, identify common etiologies for hematuria, diagnose and manage a child with acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis, and select those children who need to be referred to a nephrologist. So let's take this seven-year-old boy he comes to the emergency with a complaint of passing red urine since the, just one day. The slides, uh, uh, slides are not visible. Yeah. One is, is it better now? Yeah, yeah now you can. Acute glomerular nephritis, yes. Yes. Can you see it, Egina? Is it there? Yes, it's there. I can see yes. the, the so photo. I was, I was just showing the... you this. I don't know whether. Did you see the slide? Now I'm no, seeing. Okay, so this is, this is nothing to do with glomerulonephritis. I began by saying that I, I, had, I have good memories of my visits to Africa, and this is the big five that I bought and carried it carefully to my uh, desk, office desk, and I still have it. I see it every day and remember my trip to Africa. That was in Kenya, Masai Mara. And then this is the photograph that came uh, after that slide, which shows Dr. Beza from Addis Ababa joining our team and got trained with us for more than a year. And this was the CME that we uh, oh. conducted in Ethiopia. And we had um, a very lively audience and delegates who participated. And this was oh. the first pediatric nephrology CME in Ethiopia. Yeah, now, now, yeah. now. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. yes go from That's the beginning. Good. I thought we have not seen anything actually, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so this slide. was my first slide. Yeah, uh, okay. This was my first second slide. slide, the big five okay. again. Mm -hmm. okay, and then great. this was Dr. Beza who came in and joined us. And oh, this is our big team at St. John's Hospital. Dr. Lloyd would recognize many of them here. And yes. this is so the that's your whole, that, is, is that your whole pediatric nephrology? Uh, this was with pediatric surgery and nephrology. And you see yeah. the two Italians who are sitting beside me. They yes. are uh, professors from Rome uh, okay. through our ISN Sister Transplant Center program. Oh, so we had know. come here and Dr. Beza from Ethiopia was also with us. So she also participated in the transplant. So we had a lovely time. So uh, I just thought, you know, that's another connection yeah. with Africa we have. And this Wonderful. is uh, Beza's hospital, uh, organized Addis Ababa hospital, organized a CME. And uh, we all um, went there and we had good time because this was one of the first pediatric nephrology uh, CMEs in Ethiopia after she got trained and set it up. So I came um, down to uh, talk about acute glomerulonephritis and uh, made my four points of covering the recognition and confirmation of presence of hematuria, identify common etiologies for the hematuria, 
diagnose and manage a child with acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis and select patients with significant nephritis who need to be referred to a nephrologist. So I think now the slides are visible. Yes, 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 yes. Thank, no. thank you. So as we said, we are going to look at a, a boy who is seven years old and who came to the emergency with a history of passing urine for one day. Now he also had a history of early morning periorbital puffiness and oliguria. On examination, he was not pale. He had mild tachypnea. He was looking edematous around his eyes and the JVP was raised. There was hypertension and there was no other history that came out. But on examination, it was evident that he had this tiny scar on his foot. Parents thought that it was such a, such a simple pustule like lesion that was there and children do get it and it will come and it will go and they never gave any, any importance to it. So they never mentioned it in their uh, chief complaint. But on examination, this was noted. So putting things together, there was red urine, there was edema, there was oliguria. And on examination, importantly, hypertension uh, was recorded and there was a pyodermal scar. So the first thing that as pediatric trainees, this is directed to them, is to differentiate two important syndromes in kidney disease. One is nephritic syndrome and the other is nephrotic syndrome. So usually you see nephrotic syndrome in younger age from one year to 12 years commonly, but in nephritis, it is usually a little older age group, five to 12 years, the school going age. And gross hematuria is cola color, the typical coffee ground or cola colored uh, urine. And gross hematuria is very unusual in nephrotic syndrome. Rather the urine in nephrotic syndrome, as you all know, would be frothy in appearance. Edema is mild. It is usually limited to the periorbital area and you don't get ascites and scrotal edema in nephritic syndrome. Whereas in nephrotic syndrome, you all know the areas um, that are usually um, uh, that manifest with edema. Hypertension is common in nephritic syndrome. Hypertension is unusual in nephrotic syndrome. Proteinuria is usually not in the nephrotic syndrome, nephrotic range. It is usually less than one gram per meter square per day. And proteinuria is more than one gram per meter square per day in nephrotic syndrome. Hypoalbuminemia, even if there is some proteinuria and nephritis, is not common. But hypoalbuminemia is very much within the definition of nephrotic syndrome. Lipid profile is usually normal in nephritis and it is altered in nephrotic syndrome. Hyperkalemia is common in nephritis, but not common in nephrotic syndrome. So these are the usual um, differentiating features between the clinical manifestations between a child who has nephritis versus nephrotic syndrome. So since this child had hematuria, get into what are the causes of why did this child have hematuria? one has to always approach in this manner. You could have hematuria secondary to a glomerular disease or a non-glomerular disease. When we're talking of a glomerular disease, it could be post-infectious GN. It could be secondary to IgA nephropathy, membranoproliferative GN, or HSP nephritis, lupus nephritis, and so on. If it is a non-glomerular hematuria, then you could have secondary to stones, Secondary to Wilms tumor in a small kid, hypercalciuria, some notorious drugs like NSAIDs, cystitis, and so on. So I'm going to just introduce you to a new term. I know nephrologists are very familiar with this term, but uh, pediatric uh, trainees need to know that there is this new term, infection-related GN. So any kind of glomerulonephritis that is associated with infection comes under infection-related glomerulonephritis. It could be after an infection, it could be alongside the infection. So basically, infection-related GN is a very broad terminology. It has both post-infection-related GN and an active or syn-infectious GN. What is the difference? Post-infection comes after the cessation of infection. The infection has happened, the infection has resolved, but then you get nephritis after a few weeks. In an active infection GN, you have nephritis coming up while the infection is actively going on. And 
usually the progression cannot be prevented by antibiotic therapy when it's post-infectious because it's, it's already happened and it's resolved. But whereas if there is nephritis alongside the active infection, then you can treat the underlying infection and probably prevent um, the progression of nephritis. So here, are, uh, here is the usual list of bacterial, viral, parasitic infections that can cause post-infections of the um, organisms that can cause sin infectious or active infection gene. This is, I thought would be a useful table for again, postgraduates, uh, wherein you have a list of clinics that could give a clue to Maturia. So, and you look for edema, hypertension, pyoderma, and then you say, okay, this is glomerular nephritis. But what if I thought that, no, this is not glomerular nephritis. What would tell me that? So then I would look for abdominal mass, like in a Wilms tumor, sometimes, rarely, renal, a child, uh, upper respiratory infection, something like an adenovirus. So that hematuria is because of cystitis or they could be sensory neural deafness, and then they could be an and so on. It's important to know what are the uh, key examination features that could help us uh, give a clue to the underlying etiology of hematuria. So coming down to post streptococcal GN, so our kid had red urine hematuria, and this is usually seen in 100% of children who have uh, acute glomerular nephritis. Gross hematuria that is visible to your naked eye is only seen in 30%. So the rest of them would have definitely microscopic hematuria. You can have edema in 90% of these kids. You could have hypertension in 75 to 80% of the kids and oliguria in about 30%. So nephritis usually follows a pharyngeal infection and the gap, the latent period would be around 10 days to two weeks. And Nephritis could follow a skin infection like pyoderma after two to four weeks of the infection. So this graph here tells us that there is a latent period from the onset of streptococcal infection and resolution of that infection. There are features of nephritis that show up anywhere between two to four weeks. That is edema, gross hematuria, hypertension, and proteinuria. And if you see, all these clinical features should resolve by four to six weeks time. There are other features like hypocomplementemia. I'll be coming to more details in a bit. That again results in about two to two and a half months time. And microscopic hematuria, the topmost line you see, can take long time to resolve, as long as one to two years. So this is the usual clinical course for a typical post-streptococcal GM. Now, why do you get, what is happening? The child has come with red urine, there is hypertension, there is origuria, you are thinking of acute glomerular nephritis. But let me just take you inside the kidney. Microscopically, you see there are three cells that proliferate. This is the endothelial cell, this is the glomerular capillary tuft that is cut the same and the cell and the mesangial cell. So these three cells are tough and cells have a property to proliferate.
out. There's no free hemoglobin reacting with the acid because the bleeding is outside the parenchyma of the kidney. It is in the ureter, it could be in the bladder. So the color of the urine in hematuria in these conditions remains bright red. Proteinuria is common in glomerular disease, not so common in non-glomerular hematuria. RBCs are dysmorphic in glomerular hematuria and they are normal in shape in non-glomerular hematuria. RBC cars are seen only in glomerular hematuria. But one can see crystals may or may not be present, of course, in non-glomerular hematuria, depending on the etiology. So coming back to our group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, the nephrotogenic stains are different for skin infections and pharyngitis. So these are the usual skin infection stains and the pharyngitic strains. So the risk to develop PSGN following streptococcal infection is between five to 25%. And the risk of developing nephritis also depends on the site and strain of the infection. So what's important in terms of confirmation of PSGN is uh, undertaking the ASLO titers. So more than 200 international units or 333 TOD units is uh, telling us that there is streptococcal infection. A rising titer would be more diagnostic because if you do it very early in the course of the disease, then it may be normal. And it is usually higher in nephritis associated, uh, pharyngitis associated nephritis. The sensitivity and specificity are quite good. And there is another test called the streptozyme test, which includes four components, as you see here ASO, anti DNAs, anti hyaluronase, and streptokinase. And it is usually abnormal in more than 95% of these children. A throat swab could be positive in 20 to 25 percent, but that's not something that we do routinely in clinical practice. So what are the other tests in this child that needs to be done? Obviously, we need to look at the renal functions, the urea creatinine, because you can have uh, azotemia in 30 percent and very severe renal dysfunction in a very small proportion of 0.5 percent. Serum electrolytes become important, especially for hyperkalemia, because we all know as nephrologists, that's one complication that can be life-threatening and a silent killer. X-ray of the chest, CT brain, ECG, all this when it is really appropriate, when you're suspecting pulmonary edema or you're suspecting pneumonia, um, infection-related GN or CT scan because the child is throwing seizures, is an altered sensorium, the uh, fundus is showing some features of hypertension, or there are some neurological deficits. And ECG is, of course, uh, very important, critical when you're suspecting hyperkalemia. After this, the complement levels have a major role to play in post-streptococcal GN or any infection-related GN, that is C3 and C4. And of course, finally, we would like some investigation to tell us that streptococcal infection uh, is confirmed. So let us see what our kid had. Urea was 30, creatinine was 0 0.9, which was, which was according to uh, the lab in St. John's, uh, it was slightly on the higher side of normal for his age, serum potassium 5.5. And even that is on, on the uh, abnormal side chest x-ray, no evidence of pulmonary edema, C3 was 64, our normal range is 80 to 120, and C4 was normal. ASLO titer was less than 200 international per liter. So now you have a mixed picture because you always, always thought that the pyoderma scar caused all these problems, but here the ASLO titer is less than 200 international units per liter. So could that happen? It could because when you have pyodermal lesions, sometimes the ASLO is falsely negative. And this is because of the lipoproteins on the skin. They get attached to these antibodies and therefore these antibodies are not measured uh, in the serum sample. So the child has, I would say, borderline renal dysfunction, but not so, not so 
um, significant um, enough to say that yes, definitely the child has got acute kidney injury. Um, but if you take the oliguria there, the, uh, the urine output measurement, the child already uh, went into the criteria of uh, stage one AKI and serum potassium has been on the higher side and ECG uh, was done. There were no tall T waves, but the C3 is low. So definitely we have low C3 and we have borderline um, renal functions with hyperkinemia. So since we are trying to uh, stress on the role of complements here, when the immunoimmune complexes are deposited, they trigger the alternative pathway and therefore the complement C3 gets consumed and that level is reduced in uh, the serum. And so you get hypocomplementemia and post-infectious glomerulonephritis. You can get other pathways like the classical and the alternative pathways being involved in other glomerular uh, diseases too. So in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, if you're just wondering as to what exactly happens inside, why is there mild to moderate renal dysfunction? In most of them, the renal functions could be normal too. So what is exactly happening inside? We already saw that there is the endothelial cell proliferate. So that's one aspect that definitely can bring down the GFR because the capillary lumen in the glomerular tufts are occluded. But importantly, we have two components. So there are antibodies that are being formed against the streptococcal antigen, right? And this is an important factor. That is the nephritis-associated plasmin receptor. This is a very important factor that uh, reacts with plasmin and degrades the GBM. You also have another factor that is cationic protease exotoxin B that also stimulates more immune complex penetration through the damaged GBM. And finally, you see there are these sub-epithelial deposits and they look like humps. So they are called hump deposits, characteristic of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So if I have to show you an illustrated picture of what exactly happens there, these are the immune complex deposits, the sub-epithelial deposits in black that you see. Then you have the endocapillary proliferation and neutrophils are also seen within the glomerular tuft. And that gives it the name diffuse exudative proliferative glomerulonephritis diffuse exudative that is full of neutrophils proliferative the endothelial cell proliferates so diffuse exudative proliferative glomerulonephritis so this is the actual picture of how the biopsy would look like this the round um this this round area you see is the glomerulus it's like a pizza and you see that it's all so busy there are a lot of things there so many cells, pink material in between the cells, the mesangium, the cells are uh, the mesangial cells. And then you're looking at, if you look at the three o'clock position, you will see a capillary lumen, which is not obliterated, which is patent. It's got a whitish uh, background and it's at the third, three o'clock position. But if, do you see such a uh, capillary lumen in the rest of the pizza? No. So the glomerulus clearly looks very busy. That means there's a lot of proliferation and you don't see the capillary lumina present. So this tells us that there's endocapillary proliferation. And if you look very closely, right at 12 o'clock position, a bit lower than 12 o'clock position, you can see two neutrophils you can see the lobular appearance of the neutrophils. So this is diffuse exudative proliferative glomerulonephritis. And this is the immunofluorescence. We always talk about uh, the pretty appearance of immunofluorescence of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. There are nice names like garland appearance, starry sky appearance, and it, this is all because of the immunofluorescence that depict the antibody deposition of IgG and C3 in under immunofluorescence. 
And here you can see the electron microscopy, just to give you an, a, an idea how an electron microscopy picture would look. And if you see on the uh, one o'clock to two o'clock position, that black big um, mass there, that is actually the hump, the subendothelial uh, deposit, immune deposit that I was talking about. So to summarize, uh, the any acute nephritic syndrome would be to confirm urinary findings of dysmorphic RBCs and RBC cas, proteinuria. And if there is significant proteinuria, then we look at if there is a steady rise in serum creatinine, then we rapidly progressive GN, or you could have it with acute lupus nephritis, and then you would start um, investigations investigating on those lines. Then the role of complement would be critical here. C3 and C4, if they are normal, then uh, if they are low, then they come back to normal in about six to eight weeks time. And that's typically seen in post-infectious GN or post-streptococcal GN. And if the C3 is low, but even after six to eight weeks, the C3 doesn't come back to normal, then that can be seen in MPGN or lupus nephritis. And if there is nephritis, C4 be characteristic for our, uh, HSP nephritis. Be aware of you could come to the V's. bilateral soft alveolar infiltrates, a cardiomegaly, and there would be hypertension, elevated JVP and tender hepatomegaly. So towards nephritis, that is congestive cardiac failure, secondary to hypertension. Another important life-threatening presentation would be altered sensorium, seizures, headache, visual complaints, and what would a very tired PG, they would look at get seizures, use acute actually present in with gross. Now our kid, I told you, had a creatinine of 0.9 and we were expecting that the creatinine would come down further, probably to point our lab, normal for that was still oliguric and we repeated the creatinine the next day within 24 hours. That is concerning. There was persistent oliguria, progressive worsening of renal function like I just mentioned here. So this entity is called rapidly progressive glomeronephritis. It's a specific entity that is trying to tell you that you, that you need common cause for this would be a formation of a crescent which I'll just show you in a bit. So this is the uh, glomerular tuft again around um, Pisa, a child with PSGN. You watch out for these life-threatening complications. You definitely need to admit the child. You start monitoring on the daily weight, input, output, blood pressure, uh, the, the GCS if required and vital signs. When it comes to diet and fluids, the first thing we need to do is restrict salt because it helps to control hypertension, avoid fruits and fruit juices because we said that a child with glomerulonephritis is prone to have hyperkalemia and there should be fluid uh, restriction because usually they have oliguria. Management of hyperkalemia important to note that, well, even after giving furosemide for a few days, if you don't have good control of the blood pressure, then we add Oral nifedipine can be used if as an emergency drug. This ECG is um, bold there. You, you can see the top. No doubt anybody should be able to recognize that there is hyperkalemia. So the management of hyperkalemia would start from, because by the time you, you're waiting lab, it may be too late because I told you, Bicarbonate only if there is acidosis, otherwise you don't need to give the bicarbonate, glucose insulin uh, drip, the nebulization, if there is uh, rising creatinine, uh, persistent oliguria, the child is of uremia. This is a concept of prophylaxis, 
by using penicillin oral or uh, benzene penicillin to the index patient. What should parents know? That the penicillin, we hardly have any mortality. There is no um, uh, you know, risk for the child to go on to CKD because you see parents, whenever you talk about any kidney disease, they think it is kidney failure. They think it's only going to be dialysis or transplantation. I'm sure you also deal with such families and parents. So it's important to reassure them. And very, again, a very small proportion of them will actually have some long lasting complication. So the follow-up is important because you know that you need to chase the symptoms like gross hematuria, has it resolved? What about the microscopic hematuria? Is it resolving? It takes longer time to resolve. So you'll have to keep the child on follow-up. Proteinuria, has that resolved? Has the complement that was low initially come back to normal and so on? So when would you refer a child with hematuria? When I, when I say refer, it means that a pediatrician is definitely capable of looking after a child with PSGN, but there are certain situations that definitely need um, a consult with a pediatric nephrologist. And these situations are when the glomerular hematuria or hematuria because of PSGN uh, is, is not um, settling down. And you think that this is not looking like PSGN. This is something else because there's fever. The child has got ongoing infection. I know that the PS, the post phase of an infection is not there or there is no there is no other evidence or there is a evidence of some rash some joint pain something that is telling that there could be a systemic um, illness and not uh, necessarily a secondary to streptococcal infection that's when it's better to be in touch with a nephrologist and if the creatinine is doubling and rising like we just saw in rapidly progressive gn again better to refer if the hematuria, so the dictum is when you have post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, you usually have hematuria as just one episode. It ends there, the story is over. But if there is somewhere in the past one episode of gross hematuria, and this is the second episode, then be careful. You may not be dealing with post streptococcal uh, GN, and that needs a reference again. Microscopic hematuria, proteinuria not resolving. Again, you need to think of consulting a nephrologist. And of course, in all these situations that require a renal biopsy, it is always mandatory to get in touch with a nephrologist. So the indications for biopsy would be atypical clinical features, uh, like I said, joint involvement, skin rash, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, lymph nodes. So these are situations where you know that this is not secondary to streptococcal infection. Where you have glomerulonephritis, but the C3 is normal. And if you have a combination of nephrotic, you have hypoalbuminemia, you have nephrotic range proteinuria, you also have hypertension and hematuria, then this mixed picture also calls for a biopsy. When the creatinine is rising, again, it's an indication to do a biopsy. And the second phase is during the clinical course. You see, not has not resolved, is persisting. The low C3, which should have come back to normal, has not come back to normal. There is persistent to conclude. PSGN results in a triad of gross hematuria, hypertension, make a diagnosis, and treatment should be life-threatening situations like hypertension, fluid overload, hyperkalemia. Diuretics is therapy to manage hypertension in PSGN. Hyperkalemia can occur in a child even with normal renal function. You don't have to have creatinine raised to have hyperkalemia. So I began uh, showing you two pictures and said that those two pictures were enough to give you a um, clue of the topic's name. But when I end now, there are many more pictures that are here and the are, and I said pictures are all, those and words I've already told you today. I think this last slide should summarize it all. You have um, hematuria, you have the pyodermal scar there, you have the RBC cars, you miss out, that is the uh, pulmonary, 
uh, encephalopathy, the hyperkalemia, and if we need to do a biopsy uh, uh, in this situation, then this is how uh, the biopsy picture would look like. I would end here. Thank you very much. And I look forward to answering. Thank you, Alpana. This is excellent presentation. And uh, you, before I allow others, yes, um, so um, I, I can, let me ask you two questions. One is, uh, in your management, uh, the management of uh, acute glomerulonephritis. Yes. I, I couldn't see anywhere where you mentioned steroids. Is there any role of steroids? That's okay. number one. Number two, uh, is the can the disease recur? You know, have you in your experience have you ever seen uh, a child uh, getting the recurrence of the disease? Maybe after. Of especially post streptococcal infection. So your first question was: You do have um, it is glomerulonephritis. Yes, there is itis. The word itis there, but then in in the pathogenesis, whatever we have mentioned, you've seen that there is immune complex deposition. There is some kind of glomerular inflammation, but there is no steroids would help uh, manage the post streptococcal GN. Steroids are used in specific situations. There is IgA nephropathy, there's HSP nephritis. We do use steroids in various regimes. But in a classical post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, it is a self remitting condition. There is no role for steroids. Even when you have one of those severe complications of crescent formation, even there, there is no evidence to say that methylprednisolone pulses would be indicated if you know that it is second role of steroid. Never should happen if it is a classical post streptococcal nephritis. It is usually the audio non recurrent. It is not. If you are having audio? a second episode, that means there is something wrong somewhere. It is better to reevaluate. Probably you're missing another diagnosis. Thank you. Very good. Um, can can few questions questions <clears throat> or comment? Dr. Makwabo, can I say something, please? Y yes, please. Apna, thank you so much for that lovely presentation. I, even as uh, someone who's done a I think you did a great acute this pick easy to actually get a good grasp of the disease. Thank you, sir. Fine. I have a little question that I want to this population that we are seeing, and that is we of glomerulonephritis. And remember, I'm working. So I'm only seeing the very severe ones. Yeah. Uh, I must say the incidence in our population has dramatically decreased. We used to see between about two to 400 cases per year. Nowadays, we are rarely seeing five to 10 patients. And those are mainly the complicated ones, okay? And that's for a year compared to the 400. <laughs> so it's really decreased. And I think largely because of the fact that you know, antibiotics have become more readily available and people have become more aware the primary practitioners are treating the post traps very quickly. Yes. I think Having the said that, are treating them well, so they don't come yeah, to the yeah. center. They don't come to the center. The ones that we see, which are the complicated ones, one complication we see is that often our post traps go through a nephrotic phase. You know, mm -hmm. they develop quite severe nephrotic renuria. So by the time they present to us, our trainees are diagnosing them not wrongly as having nephrotic syndrome because yeah. of the fact that they have severe nephrotic range protein urea. The one thing that is a giveaway, the cholesterols don't go up that much, yeah. very marginally. And the other thing is that- Albumin doesn't come down to- Tend to recover. Yeah, they, the albumin doesn't come down very low. It does drop, but not yeah, as low as what you find yeah. in a severe nephrotic, okay? Yeah. But they develop ascites and they develop edema and every, all the other features of nephrotic syndrome because the post strep part of it has more or less gone. And they still have, you know what I mean? And uh, I must say in that instance, quite recover and then we had to give 
them. And so after, that's the only did time you do a where I've had to. Yes, I did a biopsy. It was classical proliferative uh, GN that we saw. And what happened so to the complement levels? It was low. The C3 was low, the C4 stays normal. So okay. after 12 weeks, it, was the C3 still low? Yeah. That was, it did recover, but not to normal levels. Okay. okay. So it was not a complication that is often, you know, so this is the un you've seen. Okay. So uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, point that you have raised. Uh, we do see rarely uh, similar case, cases like what you mentioned. And our streptococcal patients uh, come in, in in a very seasonal manner. So we still see them a lot. Uh, but what you are trying to describe is, um, is a nephritis after a confirmed streptococcal infection? Like was there evidence to say that there was yes. some pyoderma? All the evidence from the base hospital. Infection. The fact that they have this massive proteinuria yeah. and hypoalbuminemia, yeah. yes. uh, which is going to a nephrotic phase. Right. So they, 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 of course, diagnose nephrotic syndrome thereafter and say, you know, we think we might have missed a nephrotic syndrome. You understand? Yes. So and proteinuria the, is something that we see. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah. you can have proteinuria, but usually it's not in the nephrotic range. Sometimes it mm -hmm. does. And as you mentioned, again, it could also be associated with a drop in uh, albumin, but the cholesterol yeah. need not go uh, on the higher side. And uh, ascites, yes, can be there. Uh, though classically we don't see it. And uh, like the way you described, you're following up the child and then you're expecting things to recover, but you actually don't see that kind of recovery. Yeah. And you see that the nephrotic um, characteristics are yes. uh, you know, taking over. And you have those, um, you know, the edema and ascites and those uh, clinical signs that are now um, showing up. Uh, and clearly, this is not classical of post streptococcal. Uh, it's not, but it's exception. Probably, yeah. yes, it's an exception. So, in that scenario, this is a very, very specific, um, you know, challenge uh, where you may try steroids because ultimately you are thinking that there is some kind of proliferation still going on. Yes. There's some inflammation still going on. So, uh, at that point, yes, people would try to. Uh, give uh, steroids and look for the response, of course, after doing a biopsy. So uh, there's no role of steroids in the beginning, but no. if you're faced with this and you're sure that you're not missing an MPGN, you see the closest differential diagnosis yes. to PSGN is an MPGN. And even in a biopsy, one can get confused unless you have a real good pathologist or a nephropathologist who can actually give you good slight pictures of how the proliferation is. One may mistake um, the proliferation of MPGN with a PSGN. So that can happen. And the C3 remains to be on the lower side. So we may be missing entities like C3GN and MPGN. So in those patients, we have done electron microscopies and we, we um, uh, see that we don't miss MPGN, either DDD or the dense deposit disease, I mean, and uh, C3GN. Because they present like an infection related, but they don't recover. Then they have ascites, they have edema. It's like a typical nephrotic, nephritic picture. And you're wondering, um, how could this be PSGN? Well, I won't be able to answer why it was PSGN earlier, so clear cut PSGN, and why now it's not looking like PSGN. Yes, that these are exceptional um, uh, uh, clinical courses, but one should all always chase for um, making a diagnosis of C3GN and a DDD. Yes, no, I agree with that. Just one other question, please. Sorry, sure. if I, I don't want to No problem. You know, the, the thing is, when you look at post abdomen nephritis, often, you know, uh, and I know many of my colleagues teach uh, the undergraduates that if you, the way they get hypertension is they get volume overload and the blood pressure goes up. So diuretics work very well, okay? And mm -hmm. the thing is, when you make the observation, and I keep correcting them to say that, the patients who get severe volume overload really get hypertension. The ones that get the hypertension, the ones that have minimal edema, but they have various, because the mechanism is mainly based on the RAS system rather than a volume system. You know what I mean? 
So I don't know if you have the same experience. We noticed that the patients who get severe hypertension presenting with hypertensive crisis, with uh, press, posterior reversible encephalopathy, they have minimal edema. But the patients who get severe volume overload go into pulmonary edema, et cetera, the blood pressure will be raised, but not to that level where you know they, they have an hypertensive urgency. Have you noticed that? Yes. So hypertension in PSGN is usually biphasic. In the early phase, you usually have hypertension because of fluid and salt retention. And therefore, diuretics is the first drug of choice. But as you're trying to point out, mm. there is a phase where diuretics will not really help. And uh, what would be more important is to uh, control hypertension using antihypertensive drugs. And that usually happens after at least five or six days uh, when a child is already five to six days into the disease, wherein the volume component is gone now, and then the hypertension is not really volume dependent. So in that situation, you will always think of adding a calcium channel blocker, yes. but we'll be very cautious to use an AC inhibitor. I know yes. that adult nephrologists would use AC inhibitors in many glomerular diseases more than pediatric nephrologists uh, because of the nephrotoxicity and the uh, risk of the creatinine going up. So nephritis itself is enough a um, uh, risk factor for creatinine to rise. And if we use something like uh, enalapril, then we'll have to be very careful with hyperkalemia and renal dysfunction. So we hesitate and we are very cautious about using ACE inhibitors or ARBs in this situation. Calcium channel blockers are definitely uh, our first line antihypertensive uh, agents for PSGN that does not respond adequately to diuretic. So that's what my experience. I, I, my experience is the same. And we also use vasodilators sometimes like hydralazine. Yes, okay. definitely. We too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we allow more questions, please. What, what, what happened? Uh, I know it's a very small percentage of children who don't recover. Um, so how would you go about managing these children? A very, very small, probably segment who sort of don't come out. Unfortunately, sir, these kids, they just don't come back for follow-up after the first six months or one year. So, uh, you know, it's, it's like the, there was some problem, they recovered uh, and uh, the story ends there, then they don't need to come back because they're feeling fine. Uh, so I'm sure you're familiar uh, with these situations uh, in, in Africa too. So it's very difficult to pull them back on follow-up because they usually have a feeling of well-being. And um, of course, in first one year, you still can get them on follow-up and uh, uh, they, 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 they do quite well. Most of them, majority of them don't need antihypertensives after about four, four weeks into the illness. They don't need any other medication. Uh, their urine might show some microscopic hematuria, but their blood pressures, no gross hematuria, everything stabilizes. So uh, we have never experienced a classical PSGN progressing into CKD, which is, which is really good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, one last question, uh, Dr. Arpana. Yes. Uh, one last question. Uh, yes. Can you brief can you briefly tell us, you see, you started nephrology somewhere in 1995, if I remember, uh, you know, and uh, at that time, you all have the one of the best. Uh, can you tell us uh, briefly uh, how you reached this stage? Okay, so it was way back in 2000 uh, that I joined uh, St. John's and it was easy for me uh, because I joined uh, under my mentor, Dr. Kishore Fadke. Uh, figure uh, in the state and in the country and uh, I was uh, so the department first point is many of us for many of us to start with our, first of all we are pediatric, pediatric nephrology it's good to the parent department pediatrics and work um, um, closely with uh, pediatric department. Uh, so we worked uh, in that way for about five years and 
is day to day challenges that we had to face. For example, the pediatric um, uh, the, the pediatric faculty would feel that uh, the nephrotic syndrome and nephritis is something that we can treat ourselves. Why do we need a nephrologist? So yes, of course, that's true. But then there are situations where you will uh, we will have to have a close consult with nephrologists. Uh, kidney, kidney diseases don't stop with just a simple nephrotic syndrome or a simple nephritis. And so we had to build everything from scratch. We had to uh, prove to our uh, colleagues that it is important to um, approach a child with AKI in a particular way, with CKD in a particular way, uh, to do a biopsy in, uh, in, a, in a safe manner, to undertake a peritoneal dialysis in a safe manner, to slowly start um, you know, uh, 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 spreading the awareness that one can do long-term dialysis in children, do transplants in children. So Dr. Fadke uh, was already doing transplants uh, in the city and we started off with transplants in the department, but still under pediatrics. And slowly after five years, we, um, slowly uh, became a division within the department of pediatrics you see so it takes uh, it's in a very stepwise manner it takes time it took years uh, to actually uh, get the identity of being a division and after about 12 13 years from the time it all initi got initiated only then we were able to segregate ourselves as a department. So it takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of leadership, a lot of vision, commitment and dedication. Um, and today, looking back, it was worth all the effort because today we, uh, we, we, we are one of the um, uh, only centers in the country offering a postdoctoral course. So I think one of the very important component for our growth was that we started training pediatricians right from the first year of inception. So I was one of the first um, mentees for my mentor and we got many other pediatricians coming in and getting trained with us for one year. Show to the world that see, we are capable of training pediatricians in nephrology. And that was one of our pillars of strength that helped us grow, establish, become a division, become a department, and further get recognized by international societies for like IPNA and ISN for training. Um, and uh, so uh, one of our very, very strong A point must be facing to strive at least to have a good rapport. I think that's a key uh, uh, for all of us in this part of the world where there are many adult nephrologists, very few pediatric nephrologists, and uh, we always more than adult nephrologists needing us, we would need uh, the support uh, and guidance of the adult nephrologists and we always enjoyed this rapport at uh, St. John's with our adult nephrology department right from Dr. Lloyd's days till today and uh, that's that's another impor important aspect to uh, to keep in mind for the growth of um, your team your unit in your institution. You also have a molecular unit right a molecular research unit we have a research uh, unit that is part of the St. John's Research Institute. It is a um, renal genetic lab. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Anil Vasudevan, he's the one who manages the uh, lab. And uh, we do uh, genetic testing for uh, steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, children with uh, CACUT um, and uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, some of the tubular disorders. Um, so that's been another big strength, um, not only in terms of research, but also in terms of translating, uh, you know, this uh, research topic of renal genetics um, to patient care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, Dr. Lodi and Del Partner. Maybe last comment from Dr. Francis, um, who is um, our uh, senior nephrologist in this country, Tanzania specifically. Do you have any, any comment? Uh, thank you, Dr. Pana. This has been really 
an interesting uh, uh, presentation and uh, I really I can relate to what you are presenting. You know, I trained under Madam Tamila Rassi at oh, CMC okay. the Law, yeah. and uh, right. so and I could see the 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 the, the challenges that you have. Uh, negotiating between an adult unit and pediatric <clears throat> unit because the pediatric unit was under Madam Aguarao. So yes. it is interesting. And I was also able to train with Professor Minion at Red Cross Children's Hospital in <laughs> Cape Town. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think uh, it, is, it is usually very, very challenging when it comes to pediatric nephrology. And some of my colleagues in Africa that have been trained in pediatric nephrology, they abandon pediatric nephrology and they just stick with general pediatrics yes. because it that takes a lot of efforts and it needs a lot of investment. Yes. So I think it is, a, it is, it is a good. And, and, and the funny story about Tanzania is the fact that we have a lot of pediatricians that have been trained in adult nephrology, yes. which is also interesting yeah. That, yeah. that we... We, we work with them now, which is quite good. So on your presentation, the only thing that I would like to um, just remind people is the fact that these patients can present with complications. And occasionally, most of the time when they come with um, convulsions, when they have hypertensive encephalopathy, we usually thrown away with the seizures and we are always stri striving to manage seizures with anticonvulsants. And sometimes you might even think that it is not responding. Yeah. But the, 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 the basic thing is being able to manage the hypertension. I remember recently I had a small kid, uh, four years old, presenting with very severe hypertension and convulsing so hard. We had to give three antihypertensives to control the blood pressure. So this can happen and oftentimes we always rush to try to manage the, 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 the convulsions. So I think it is, it is a, a good and eye-opening. It shows us something that is very common in our setting, which might not be that common in the developed countries. They don't see persistent nephritis in, in the first world now. Yeah. So I guess this is something that we need to put in mind and continue to watch for and mm. see if we can manage. And the good thing is it's fortunate that we just need to manage them symptomatically and they do fare quite well. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for reminding us of this talk and uh, sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely comments. Great interaction. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I think I'm going to see you all again next week. Thank you, Alpana. We'll see you next week again. Sure. And, and of our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Lloyd, for your comment. Thank you, Thank Bima, you, and Thank everyone you. who Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. So, see Bye -bye. you next week, uh, same see you time. Next week. Good night. All right. Good night. Thank you very much, Arpana. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.